And now we move into common problems in acute care part two. Let's start with some practice questions. If your patient with arthritis develops Bouchard's nodes, where are these located? Bouchard's nodes. DIPs, PIPs, MCPs, RIS. And the answer is B, the PIPs. So sometimes, and I want to tell you that this was a question on the ANCC website recently, and I changed it from Hebbidin's nodes to Bouchard's nodes to say that, you know, sometimes there's just two lines and you have to know facts. You either know it or you don't. And we'll talk about which one is where shortly. But at other times there'll be a 10 line scenario and you have to pull out the pertinent positives and the pertinent negatives. So sometimes it's just factual. And this is an example here. All of these are considered early signs of HIV except early signs of HIV except and the answer is A. Fever is true, night sweats is true, weight loss is true and while fatigue is true vague abdominal pain is false. So I like this item because it reminds me to remind you that you have to accept the entire answer as true or it is false. And so while the fatigue is true, abdominal pain is false, and that is not one of the early signs of HIV. On fundoscopic exam, you should expect to normally see that the The answer is B, bigger than the arteries. And of course, what am I telling you here? Be ready for the eye exam. All right, and we will cover a little review on that too. And so let's jump in. First of all, we'll talk about poisoning or drug toxicities. And history is the first and most important step of the assessment. Toxicology screens are usually drawn to rule out multiple ingested agents, but it's important to remember that most overdoses are treated with simply supportive care. That is, what is the thing they need? If their blood pressure is low, they need fluids. Um, and yet, there's been a long history of several types of gastrointestinal decontamination. And I could say as a whole that um, four out of five of these are somewhat controversial, depends on the facility and also on the ingestion, of course, how long it's been, what kind of ingestion they had. The one that does help is if you have an anecdote, but to whatever the patient overdosed on, but often, of course, that is not the case. So let's review a little bit. Gastric lavage is again controversial. It's rarely used today and most beneficial within the first hour of ingestion. So putting down a tube, perhaps pulling back fragments, normal saline, looking to see if there are any fragments that are there, but it's rarely done today. Activated charcoal. Mm, what do we know about this is that activated charcoal helps to bind the drug and so it's still fairly commonly used, at least perhaps one dose, one to two grams per kilogram of body weight to a maximum of 100 grams in adults. But again, it's most beneficial within the first hour of ingestion as well, or certainly as soon after the ingestion as possible. Cathartics are not routinely indicated after activated charcoal. However, sorbitol, which is a cathartic, is often used with the first dose of activated charcoal. There's some argument in the literature about repeating activated charcoal, and again, I think it would depend on the type of ingestion, the extent of the in ingestion, and your hospital protocol. Controversial, but WBI using propylethylene glycol may be used to treat enteric coated or sustained release overdoses. So how uh, WBI works, it doesn't really bind the drug, but it helps poop it out to move it on out. 
And that's the same thing, of course, that the cathartic does with the activated charcoal. It helps to move it through the bowel. And the one that is, again, helpful if you have it, but often we don't, is a specific antidote to what was ingested. Your drug choice for a benzodiazepine overdose is which of these? The answer is C, flunazenil, which is romazicon. And of course, not to mix up opiate overdose with benzo. Opiates are reversed by Narcan, naloxone, and benzos are reversed by flumazenil. So now we're going to look at some specific intoxications, overdoses, acetaminophen and salicylate being very common, the first two. So with acetaminophen intoxication like Tylenol or similar products, this is true for both acetaminophen and for four salicylates. Usually patients are asymptomatic for quite some time, usually the first 24 hours or so. And then around 24 to 48 hours, they begin to show some signs and symptoms like nausea and vomiting, right upper quadrant pain may present, as well as signs of hepatotoxicity, including jaundice, elevated LFTs, prolonged PT, altered mental status, and delirium. Activated charcoal is used, and then there is a product used in acetaminophen intoxication that's not used in salicylate intoxication, and that's in acetylcysteine, the A in acetaminophen and the A in acetylcysteine. That is mucomist, and of course it smells like rotten eggs, right? But again, supportive care. What needs to be done next? Salicylate intoxication here, like with aspirin. So signs and symptoms again are often delayed. And what do you see when you see? Nausea, vomiting, tinnitus, dizziness, headache. So ringing in the ears is something to look for. More of a hyperthermia-like prodrome comes with salicylate intoxication and leading on to apnea, cyanosis, and even metabolic acidosis with eventually elevated LFTs. So again, gastric lavage, uh, activated charcoal is going to be used predominantly here, at least for one dose, and the patient will be symptomatically treated. Uh, sodium bicarb might be used in the plan of care to correct severe acidosis, but again, that's pretty severe. The same uh, definition is used in ACLS, having a pH of less than 7.1. Organophosphate, insecticide poisoning. Signs and symptoms, nausea, vomiting, cramping, diarrhea, excessive salivation with headache. Blurred vision with meiosis is common. And again, meiosis is constriction. You see the O in meiosis, the O in constriction bradycardia may occur, along with mental confusion, slurred speech, and coma. So if it's an external uh, exposure, wash the skin thoroughly. If it was ingested, activated charcoal is usually used at least one time. And atropine is the drug of choice to be standing by because bradycardia can occur. Antidepressant toxicity. We talked a little bit earlier about serotonin but others as well. And when someone overdoses on antidepressants, they tend to look a little more psych-like. Confusion, hallucinations, blurred vision may be there with urinary retention, leading on to hypotension, tachycardia, and dysrhythmias, uh, hypothermia, as well as seizures. We admit this patient to the ICU if CNS or cardiac toxicity are evident. Again, activated charcoal is appropriate in most cases. Um, sodium bicarb to counter dysrhythmias and maintain pH if the patient is very severe. Benzos IV as needed to control seizures and serotonin syndrome treated with dantrolene sodium, dantrium, an old drug, still a good drug um, for reversal or treatment, hopefully, of toxicity here with serotonin syndrome. Opioid toxicity, codeine, heroin, morphine, opium, and others. Heroin, keep that in mind that it is an opioid. 
And so when somebody has an opioid toxicity, they're going to experience a relaxed euphoria and therefore drowsiness, hypothermia, respiratory depression, and shallow respirations. We're worried they're going to stop breathing, obviously. Meiosis, which they will start with constricted pupils that then lead on to pinpoint pupils, often with opioid toxicity. And notice that cocaine and crack uppers, ecstasy, these cause mydriasis dilation. The D in mydriasis and the D in dilation. So pay attention to pupils. With a relaxed euphoria, you're going to see meiosis leading on to pinpoint pupils with opioids. And with an upper kind of accelerated um, euphoria, cocaine, crack, ecstasy, mydriasis. So management for opioid toxicity, again, of course, emetics are contraindicated, activated charcoal as appropriate, but again, the drug, the mainstay, naloxone or Narcan to remember. Benzodiazepine overdose, just a reminder, these are the PAMs, and again, a relaxed euphoria, so drowsiness, confusion, leading on to slurred speech, respiratory depression, and even hyporeflexia respiratory and blood pressure support are needed, um, as needed. Flumazenil is the drug, Romazicon IV, and activated charcoal if, again, the ingestion has not been so long ago. A patient overdosed on metoprolol about five hours ago. Which of these would be most beneficial at this time? Narcan, charcoal, flumazenil, glucagon. And the answer is glucagon. And we will look here at the beta blocker overdose, the, the lol drugs, if you will. Well, beta blockers, what do they do? They slow heart rate, um, and they can also lower blood pressure. So what's the worst thing that can happen when you have an overdose is if the drug works really, really well. Hypotension, sinus bradycardia, leading on to delirium, coma, sometimes bronchospasm. So charcoal may be appropriate if it was a recent ingestion, but like in that case I just gave you five or six hours in, Glucagon has been shown to be by far superior in helping reverse the bradycardia and increasing contractility as well to give you to reverse some of the hypotension. Um, and so very helpful here. Atropine if needed acutely and of course stabilization of the airway. Now let's move on to burns. First, second, and third degree burns. And remember a first degree Dry redness, uh, no blisters, involves just the epidermis only. A second degree is also known as partial thickness. You need to know that um, because it's going to help you a little bit in a moment when we talk about the burn center referral criteria. But remember that a second degree has something that a first degree does not, and that is blisters. When you have a blister, finger on the stove, accidentally there'll be a quick blister, it has gone through the epidermis, it extends beyond that epidermis, and you have a second degree or partial thickness burn. Third degree, full thickness injury, described as dry, leathery, can be black or pearly and waxy. It extends from the epidermis to the dermis to the underlying tissues, the fat, uh, the muscle, and or the bone. So measuring the extent of burn injury. The adult rule of nines, remember that each arm is nine, each leg is 18. The thorax is 18 on the front and 18 on the back. The head is 9% and the perineum genitals about 1%. So even if only part, say a right cheek gets burned, a splash burn or something, they see it coming. We count the whole 9% because it involved the head. And it's helpful to note that and remember that about 1% of total body surface area may be depicted in the size of the patient's palm. 
So you could have men at the same age, but totally different body weight sizes. Look at the palm of their hand. About 1% is what that represents. So there should be nine hands uh, equivalent to one arm, for example. And therefore, that guides fluid resuscitation. We have to have an adequate approximation of how much was burned. You remember that this is the Parkland formula that calls for around four milliliters per kilogram time the TBSA percent burned during the first 24 hours. That's the calculation of how much crystalloid they're going to need. Four milliliters per kilogram times the TBSA percent burned. And it takes a lot of fluid. So let me give you an example. Um, let's say that your patient was 100 kilograms, because we like that, and that he is 70% burned. So how much does he need initially according to the Parkland formula? He is 70% burned and he's 100 kilos. I know, nurses and math, right? It's going to take a while. Well, it's usually only off by a zero or two. Let's calculate together four milliliters per kilogram. So that's four times 100 times 70. 28,000 milliliters is how much fluid and crystalloid he needs in the first 24 hours. 28 IV bags, that's a lot. And so point number two, a lack of fluid is frequently a major problem under resuscitation of the patient. More times than not, the patient needs more fluid. And remember that fluid resuscitation begins at the time of the burn injury and not when the patient finally reaches the hospital or the burn center. So often we're way behind the ball by the time the patient gets to a burn center. Also remember a little bit of the calculation about Parkland formula here in number four. As a general rule, half of all the fluid requirements that are needed in the first 24 hours are administered within the first eight hours of the injury with the remaining fluid being administered over the next 16 hours. So again, half in the first eight, one fourth in the next eight, one fourth in the last eight of the 24 hour period. So if he needed 28,000 milliliters, half of that is going to be administered in the first eight hours. So that's very much a rapid infuser. So again, perhaps look for any time you have a major burn patient and they suddenly drop their urine output, consider that lack of fluid may well be the problem. They're still under fluid resuscitated. And then as you monitor the patient, you want to monitor for metabolic acidosis is expected during the early resuscitation phase and look out for electrolytes and particularly potassium. During the first 24 to 48 hours, you'll be monitoring more for hyperkalemia because all the fluid kind of seeped out. There's some hemoconcentration of what's left. And then about three days post burn injury, so again, we do this massive fluid resuscitation and if your patient lives, there's a huge diuresis syndrome that happens around day three. And so around three days post major burn, your most important monitoring would be for hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia initially, hypokalemia about three days later. Indications for prophylactic intubation, very much like in uh, anaphylactic shock, you may not be able to get the tube down, so it's better to err on the safe side. That laryngeal edema is a common and quick complication of sunburns, so immediate prophylactic intubation should occur with any evidence of things like burns to the face, singed nares or eyebrows, dark soot or mucus from the nares or the mouth. And the emergent burn pearls, essentially the things that we saw growing up as kids that people did when somebody got a burn, are not okay. They're really not by national guidelines. You are to submerge the injured area in clean, cool water if possible. 
Do not use ice, lotion, toothpaste, lard, butter, or other products. If you've got to go to the medical center, you wrap the area in a clean, dry towel and transport to the nearest hospital. There, sterile normal saline is going to be used in initial treatment. There really is no betadine peroxide or other products that are used. And again, once there, the affected areas are going to be wrapped or covered with sterile towels. Important to maintain normal temperature. Again, very important because um, patients lose body temperature. So 37 and often they'll be given a little cap as well to keep warm. And following stabilization, pain management with intravenous fentanyl and or morphine uh, with optional use of Versed for memory impairment are most commonly used. Really a lot of fentanyl and um, Versed can be used because fentanyl, of course, is 100 times stronger than morphine. And then what about special needs in populations that are burned, like patients who have a tar burn injury? You would need to uh, consider the use of a petroleum-based product, a petroleum-based product, and um, something like baxitracin ointment um, to remove the burning tar. Baxitracin ointment is used uh, sometimes petroleum jelly is used, sometimes even mayonnaise can be used as well. And then what looks like mayonnaise, you remember, is silvosulfadiazine or silvadine. And this is a common topical antibacterial antifungal that's used to treat second and third degree burns. So I would highlight the American Burn Association's Burn Center Referral Criteria. If you're working in an outlying area and you need to, how do you know that you really need to transport the patient? Well, some of it's common sense and some of it is uh, by criteria. And I would learn these 10. The first five or six, the first six make really good sense. Partial thickness burns, and what was that? second degree of greater than 10% total body surface area. Any burns that involve the face, the hands, the feet, the genitalia, the perineum, or major joints. Any of those just takes one, but it's certainly combinations of those. They need to go to a professional burn center. Third degree burns in any age group, electrical burns, including lightning injuries, chemical burns, inhalation injuries. And then it gets a little more clouded here with the last a few. Number seven, a burn injury in patients with pre-existing medical disorders that could complicate management, prolong recovery, or affect mortality. Any patient with burns and concomitant trauma and that pretty much makes sense because the patient is much more likely to die of the trauma before they do their burn. So let's say the guy was in a rollover car accident crash and uh, he was expelled burning uh, from the windshield. Uh, he is much more, he does have third degree burns, but he's much more likely to die this afternoon from his um, lacerated liver and maybe hemonymothorax, his trauma, than he is his burn injury this afternoon. Burn children in hospitals without qualified personnel or equipment for the care of children, often community hospitals are just not equipped um, to care for children like that. And any burn injury in patients who require special social, emotional, or rehabilitative intervention. Again, a little gray there, but you can make the case that they're going to need more close attention. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS, an immune deficiency in which the human immunodeficiency virus uses the T cell, known as the CD4 cell, as both the receptor and a reservoir for HIV. And interesting, uh, the T cell and the virus kind of have this immediate attraction and the T cell, the CD4 says, ah, well, why don't you just come live with me and um, I will be your reservoir. I will take care of you. 
And the virus says, well, you know, that sounds pretty good. I think I will. And then everything goes okay for a while until the virus winds up killing the host who invited it in to stay and then destroys the immune system in the entire body. So it's an interesting kind of fatal attraction that the HIV and the CD4 have together. And modes of transmission have really not changed over the years. Blood, semen, vaginal secretions, breast milk, among others. And if, of course, let's kind of go on the sideline and recall the three most likely behaviors for transmitting HIV. And number one is needle sharing. Needle sharing would just be blood to blood. So a very high risk activity. Unfortunately, we have a big a drug problem in our country and people use needles all the time. And if they have to risk HIV, they do to get their drug. Number two, unprotected anal intercourse. Why do we like Tylenol suppositories so much? Because they work. In around 20 minutes or so, the temperature is going to be markedly down, but of course, going straight into the bloodstream. And number three, unprotected vaginal intercourse. So in order of severity, if you will, needle sharing, unprotected anal intercourse, unprotected vaginal intercourse. All right, and so what does early HIV look like? A flu-like prodrome. You want to think seroconversion. And what is seroconversion? The process of converting from HIV negative to HIV positive. And how long does that take? Three weeks to six months. And also early signs and symptoms predominantly include fever, night sweats, and weight loss. So very easy then to kind of look at what are the early signs of HIV. And they are fever, night sweats, weight loss with a flu-like prodrome. And remember that it's more of a constellation of signs and symptoms than any one single one that is suspicious for AIDS. I remind you of the CDC definition of AIDS versus HIV positive and that is having a T cell count or a CD4 of less than what? 200 and or the presence of an opportunistic infection. So I had a patient come in who was 32 and she had bronchitis that just would not let up and we did a chest x-ray and she had pneumocystis pneumonia. So immediately she goes to a diagnosis of AIDS without even knowing that she's HIV positive because if you apply this definition, you don't have to have a T cell or a CD4 to diagnose it. One would not have pneumocystis pneumonia if you had a fairly healthy immune system that was intact. And so that is how you can use the definition to move on to uh, something that's a little bit more severe in, that's very different when I say I'm admitting an AIDS patient versus I'm admitting an HIV positive patient. And just as a reminder that you're not supposed to change that terminology uh, once you, one meets the definition. So again, there's a big difference in telling the healthcare team, whoever reads the chart appropriately, that your patient is HIV positive versus they are actually an AIDS patient. For labs and diagnostic tests, we have some changes that have gone on in the country. Not everybody is there yet. Not even sometimes the certifying bodies. They might be a little bit behind reality of what's happening around the country with retiring Western blot. But not everywhere has retired Western blot. So I'm covering everything here so that you are in the know today, up to date, regardless of what you're asked on a board, you carry this with you to your practice. Historically, the initial screening test has been the ELISA, and it was confirmed by Western Blot. Well, Western Blot has been retired for the most part in the country and has been replaced 
by these latest recommended HIV tests. And the first is the HIV 1 slash 2 antigen antibody combination immunoassay. And if it's positive, one proceeds on to the HIV 1 slash 2 antibody differentiation immunoassay. So a couple of advantages here. You see that it screens for both HIV 1 and HIV 2. It also tries to pick up antigen and antibody in its test as well. So we used to have to wait and figure out, okay, three months maybe you've had enough antibodies build up and there was that window of time. Western blot had lots of issues and the biggest one other than cost were false results, false negatives and false positives and either one of those would be bad. If you had HIV and I told you you didn't, that would be bad. And if you didn't have HIV and I told you you did, that would be bad. So the sensitivity of the HIV 1 slash 2 antigen antibody combo immunoassay is outstanding. It's quite excellent. And as you see, not only would that first blood sample be drawn, but the second one as well. And so today when somebody is told that they're HIV positive new, using the newest test, pretty much uh, there's little room for error. ELISA is not going away completely. It's still used in swabs for tests, like oral tests at nonprofits or say uh, Know Your Status campaigns by the health department and others on weekends, downtown, wherever you live to try and convince people to at least know their status. So that ELISA will be what is used there, um, but again, Certainly not as sensitive, of course, as the new tests are today. So when you're talking to your HIV positive patient, what are the most important things to listen to? And you ask them about their numbers. They call them their numbers. My T is four. My T is nine. They mean they have nine total CD4 cells, period, floating around. And in this list, the most important things to listen for, how is your patient's absolute CD4 lymphocyte count, or their T cell, number four, and number six, how is their viral load, C. Ideally, it should be zero or undetectable, okay? So again, that inverse relationship, the T cells will be low, and if somebody has AIDS, they will be lower than 200 and sometimes bouncing back up, but hovering right there. They will be low uh, for the most part. But more importantly, if a patient says, my numbers are up just a little, you need to really encourage them to go back to their primary, back to their HIV specialist, because what numbers are up when this is discussed? It's viral load. And that means that their meds are not working the way that they used to, and we have to get them on something that works. Lastly here, management. Um, therapy for opportunistic infections. We generally treat infection as it occurs, but what is the number one killer of AIDS patients? It is pneumonia, and it's a certain type of pneumonia called pneumocystis urovetsi. And so AIDS patients often take something every day to try and counter pneumocystis irovetsi, and it is Bactrim. Antiretroviral treatment combination therapy is now standard, of course. When to start ART remained a little bit controversial for some time. Um, but now the CDC and HHS recommend starting meds at the time of HIV positive diagnosis. It's kind of like metabolic syndrome or calling somebody a type two diabetic. Just call it what it is and let's start doing some treatment before the virus begins to wreak havoc on the immune system. And it's very important to monitor for the danger of drug resistance in these patients. Meds must be taken exactly as they're prescribed every day Fortunately, we have a couple of once a day preparations and everything else is like twice a day or so. 
But even with the once a day preparations, it's encouraged to take them at the same time every day. So like noon or something that you can remember, different people have breakfast at different eight, nine, seven, ten. 10, who knows? But noon every day might be a tip off for your patient to easily take it at the same time every day. And another problem is not taking meds and it's not necessarily that they didn't want to take their meds but why is it that at least clearly documented in the literature patients who have hiv or aids are not always as compliant with their meds as we think they might should be and the list is extensive i mean you could talk about financial concerns you could talk about lack of support emotional support uh, stigma but nonetheless most people who take hiv meds don't pay for them and they are supported by nonprofits and pharmaceutical companies but the good point is that they make them follow be seen often by a primary care nurse practitioner be followed in order to get free meds you have to go in and you have to have your t-cell and your viral load and you have to report that when you go for your meds and so a big problem is access to care ACCESS just getting an appointment um, or having to take off work because of course there is only an appointment this time on this day and what if the patient works so access to care is a barrier to HIV and AIDS patients taking their meds um, the way that they are exactly the way they're supposed to be taken osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis these are big concerns of pain in many of our patients so let's break these down I have them in a nice comparison chart but let's talk about each of them separately osteoporosis is degenerative meaning it continues a downward spiral we just try to help and hopefully prevent it from getting worse but it will never get any better there's slow destruction of the articular cartilage and it is asymmetrical. There's nothing symmetrical about a left knee osteo. About 85% of us will develop this in our lifetime. Men and women are equally affected and generally involves the weight bearing joints, the knees, the hips, as well as the fingers, hands, and wrists. There's swelling and edema, but there's no redness or heat complaints. No redness or heat complaints. And it involves Heberden's and Bouchard's nodes. Okay, so we need to review which one is where. Well, it's pretty easy. Which one is distal in the alphabet, B or H? H. And which one is proximal in the alphabet? B. So your DIPs, where Heberden's nodes are, are far in the distance. They are your last little knuckles there. And the PIPs are in the middle of your finger. Bouchard's nodes develop there. So know which one is where, as you saw. Uh, we're going to need to know. And then we'll, we'll contrast that with rheumatoid in a minute. Notice that the osteopatient is better in the morning, but they get worse as the day progresses, aggravated by activity, relieved by rest. So you're trying to shop with a geriatric patient, a grandma, grandpa type. They're going to have to rest frequently because their, they, their joints begin to hurt. Again, genetic predisposition is likely. Increased incidence with age. Obesity is an exacerbating factor, makes it worse. Angular deformities of affected joints may occur with limited range of motion and sometimes even crepitus. There are no labs that are specific to osteoarthritis. With regard to diagnostics, the synovial aspirate would be normal, clear to yellow in somebody with osteo. And on x-ray, you would expect to see narrowing of the joint space, osteophytes, juxta articular sclerosis with some subchondral bone as well management involves aspirin or acetaminophen and NSAIDs and again you never want somebody to be on NSAIDs for a long period of time 
but this would certainly be a time that might be helpful. And yet when somebody is going to be on NSAIDs, you want to make sure that their creatinine is in very good shape. And again, what's normal creatinine? 0.5 to 1.5. So BUN 10 to 20, 0.5 to 1.5 is your creatinine. And you want to make sure you have good renal function before somebody is put on NSAIDs. Supportive care strategies, weight loss, the use of canes on the opposite side, that is a highlight because if you have a bad right knee, you use it with your left hand. So when the right leg goes down, there's going to be pressure on the left hand. Ice, improving range of motion, moist heat, decreases muscle spasms and relieves stiffness from time to time. Physical therapy may be helpful. And in patients where it's not, sometimes they have to be referred for joint replacement. Rheumatoid arthritis, with regard to pathology, is a systemic autoimmune disease causing inflammation of connective tissue. And the inflammation is symmetrical. And that's interesting. And I think it's very, uh, it's, a, it's a very tailing point that if I could ask only one question to try to determine very quickly which one do you have, is it osteorheumatoid? I think symmetrical would be the best question to ask because there's nothing symmetrical again about osteo. With rheumatoid, women uh, outnumber men. It's more common in women around three to one. And the involvement on the hand is very different. It involves the PIPs, the MCPs, and the wrists. And so you can see here, where are your PIPs? They're right in the middle of your uh, finger. That's that middle joint. Your MCPs, your metacarpophalangeal, those are your knuckles and uh, the wrists. So often there is something called ulnar deviation, U-L-N-A-R, that's associated with rheumatoid in the hand. You might want to write that in on the right. Ulnar deviation, so that the hands deviate outwards, ulnar direction. Um, and that's common with women who have rheumatoid arthritis. And also, another tell-all sign is that the swelling and the edema, their complaints include redness and heat to the joints. It, it looks red and it feels warm. That's classically rheumatoid joint involvement, not osteo. With regard to pain patterns, remember that RA patients are worse in the morning, but then get better as the day progresses. So you want to teach the RA patient to get up, take her shower, um, get ready for work, have her breakfast, and take a rest period. And that's helpful so that when she gets to work, she'll feel like doing her work, usually much stiffer in the morning. Other findings, again, it is an autoimmune disease. We may consider that there's multifactorial etiology to it. Fatigue, weakness, malaise, anorexia, maybe some weight loss. So again, signs of autoimmune disease if you're early on the diagnosis. ESR is usually elevated. Not necessarily ANA though. ANA is positive in only about one in five patients. And with regard to diagnostics, the synovial aspirate would show inflammatory changes with white blood cells. So x-ray findings, joint swelling with progressive cortical thinning and osteopenia, not osteophytes, but osteopenia, followed by joint space narrowing. And what may work for these? Yes, high dose salicylates and NSAIDs may work, but the classic category of meds for rheumatoid patients, DMARDs, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And it usually starts off with a trajectory, first of all, corticosteroids, then moving up to methotrexate, 
keep in mind methotrexate is an old drug it's a good drug and because it's been around a long time it is cheap and that is a highlight old guys are cheap well gentlemen we just kind of have to suck it up there but it's true and that's true of meds as well older meds are cheaper than newer meds and yet when somebody is on methotrexate what lab value do you need to watch most closely and the answer is LFTs. So LFTs for methotrexate and creatinine for NSAIDs. And then today, you might choose to move up, the rheumatologist may choose to, to move up, I should say, to antimalarials or gold salts. But what often happens is uh, trying one of the newer injectable agents and I don't believe these would be on a board exam for acute care, but I will tell you that you can get financial aid for your patient if needed, and because they're extremely expensive, but like Humira, uh, there's been some huge success with patients for which steroids and methotrexate just didn't make the cut, but when they tried one of the new injectables, it did. So there's good news in the future for that. Early rheumatologist referral. Again, not to be playing around with somebody who has RA, get the specialist on board quick. Rest, physical therapy, and in rare cases, do they have to have any type of surgery? We review some orthopedic terms. Of course, we understand a fracture that can be closed or open. And what's the only type that you would give an antibiotic to would be an open fracture where the skin is broken and the underlying tissues are open to air. Remember that in avulsion, you have bone fragments that are pulled off by attached ligaments and tendons. And then there's dislocation versus subluxation. There's just a disruption between normal relationships of joint surfaces and the x-ray confirms the diagnosis. So how does a dislocation differ from a subluxation? A subluxation is essentially just an incomplete dislocation. Compartment syndrome. Increased interstitial pressure within a closed fascial compartment may result from hemorrhage, edema, sustained external pressure on a limb or a constrictive cast dressings, and it should be suspected in any unconscious patient with a swollen limb. And now this involves the fascial compartment, you see, and let's recall that you have skin, fascia, muscle, bone. So the fascial compartment is way up high. It's right under the skin and above the sub-Q muscle and bone. And that is the part that has an increased surge in pressure. Like with um, trauma patients, a tib-fib fracture, or an ORIF of a tib-fib fracture, sets a patient up for potentially compartment syndrome. When we look at signs and symptoms, all of these are pertinent, but you have to ask yourself, um, let's say you had uh, a patient who had long bone ORIF of some long bone surgery uh, that was fractured and you go and you assess it. Well, many of these look like 24 hour post-op pain, what you're going to see the next day. And yet some of these don't make sense for what to be expected with normal post-op pain. So you have to assess for things like severe ischemic pain. That would not be normal post-op pain. That would be more for compartment syndrome. Tensely swollen, uh, even an ORIF should not be tensely swollen. Skin perfusion and arterial pulses will remain normal until the very end. And so that one you can't really, uh, you know, make your bet on to give yourself the differential. But paresthesia is another one. That's not a part of normal post-op pain. Passive stretch of the muscle is painful, then progressive loss of sensory and motor function, and repeated exams are required to check for, again, developing compartment syndrome. 
So look at number one and number four. These are telltale signs that it's not just simply severe pain, say from after surgery. If the area, uh, if, if he is complaining or she is complaining that there is severe ischemic pain in that area and paresthesia, these are the two earliest signs of compartment syndrome. And with regard to diagnostic testing, we often use what's called a striker tonometer. S-T-R-Y-K-E-R -E is like the brand, but tonometer is what you want to remember that's used. And you literally are going to stick this uh, needle in that compartment area and measure it. So remember that normal compartment pressure is like 0 to 8 millimeters of mercury. And intracompartmental pressure is greater than or equal to 30. That indicates a compartment syndrome and a need for fasciotomy. But one may decide to do it even at a lower value. The intracompartmental pressures increase to within 10 to 30 millimeters mercury of the patient's diastolic blood pressure. This indicates inadequate perfusion and a relative ischemia of the involved extremity. The perfusion pressure of a compartment, which is also known as the delta pressure, is the difference between the diastolic blood pressure and the intracompartmental pressure, the ICP. So delta pressure equals the DBP minus the ICP. And again, any delta pressure less than or equal to 30 millimeters of mercury is indicative of the need for urgent fasciotomy. And that is the treatment other than releasing, constricting appliances or if the cast is on too tight, it is a fasciotomy and that unfortunately is like a carrot peeler approach to the area uh, for which you have increased compartmental pressure. Systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, multi-system inflammatory autoimmune disease that affects primarily women of childbearing age. And I put in the manual and here on the slide like 18 signs and symptoms that really don't go together. Fever, anorexia, malaise, but weight loss. Uh, most women, more common it is in women who have lupus, most do not have a butterfly rash. But if you draw a question on the exam, she will have a butterfly rash. And you're like, okay, I got the lupus question here. A lot of other strange things, splinter hemorrhages, alopecia, Raynaud's phenomenon in some women, photosensitivity, among others. And so these signs and symptoms, the first tip off is if she's of childbearing age and none of these kind of go with each other, then what could it be? The lab and diagnostic workup, this is important. ANA is positive in about 95% of patients. Antiphospholipid antibodies need to be explored because these patients may not clot the same way as others. Anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia are often present in patients with SLE. And for mild symptoms, you want to encourage bed rest with mid-afternoon naps. And for mild symptoms, bed rest with mid-afternoon naps, an avoidance of fatigue, sun protection, topical glucocorticoids for isolated skin lesions, NSAIDs, hydrochloroquine, glucocorticoids, and other therapies may also be incorporated as well. Drugs indicated in a lupus-like syndrome, and I narrowed this down to around 30, before you start memorizing, let's kind of analyze. Well, the first message is a lot of meds masquerade as lupus, meaning they have lupus-like signs and symptoms, but it's not the lupus, it's actually their med. So there are some outliers and you can, you know, study through this list several times, but one thing, there is a slight pattern and it's cardiovascular meds. So let me show you here. Amiodarone, atenolol, 
Captopril, Diltiazem, Hydralazine. Mm. We look over here, number 17, Lovastatin, two statin agents are here, Lovastatin, and number 27, Simvastatin. Um, and then there are some other interesting ones, menocycline, nitrofurantoin. Number 21, oral contraceptives. And remember, this is usually a woman of childbearing age. And so if she's taking OCs, that's usually the first place that changes are made to use another form of contraception. All right, so I think that will get us a pretty good set there. Many drugs, masquerade, looking like lupus, and really what you're doing is you're looking at that med list while you're waiting on the labs to come back. Giant cell arteritis is a temporal arteritis, inflammatory condition primarily affecting patients over the age of 50. But you recall if you miss it, it can lead to permanent blindness. It accounts for about 15% of all cases of fever of unknown origin in patients over 65. So you have an elderly patient come in, they have a fever, which again is an eyebrow raiser because often they don't, but yours does. Um, this is certainly something that should be at the top of your differential. What else might accompany them other than a fever? headache or scalp tenderness, sometimes visual symptoms are present, jaw claudication, temporal artery may be more nodular, enlarged, or tender, and the fever may be quite high, as high as 40 degrees centigrade or 104 Fahrenheit, with chills and or rigors or rigors, if or how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. Miserable. And so, Labs and diagnostics with giant cell arteritis. Interestingly, you have a very high ESR inflammation, but normal white count, normal WBC. So you know right there, it's not a bacteria. Temporal artery biopsy may be done, and it's positive in most patients, but the management would be prednisone, send them out with a prednisone taper and referral for follow-up with the temporal artery. Eye disorders. Well, the common eye and what does it look like and the problems that happen in the eye. I realized that the last time you assessed an eye with a scope was probably two years ago in that stupid checkoff that they make everybody do. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we have to revisit what normal anatomy looks like is here on the slide and in your manual. Um, the eye, of course, the optic disc is donut-like shaped with an orange-pink neuroretinal rim and a central white depression called the physiologic cup. And with regard to the cup disc ratio, the cup should not be more than half the size of the disc diameter. And if it is, then you should consider that glaucoma is the most likely reason. When you explore the eye and you look at the arteries and the veins, here is a highlight, the arteries are brighter red and narrower than the veins to the tune of say two to three or four to five. But the arteries are brighter red and yet they are narrower than the veins in the eye. So I just remember that out here in your arm, it's, re it's like the artery is large and your veins are small. The reverse is true in the eye. Then the macula is centered about two to two and a half disc diameters temporal to the optic disc and it's avascular. So that temporal is important. Which way are you going? Temporal uh, in, in the patient. And within that macula, you recall that there is this place called the fovea centralis and that is the place of keenest vision. So if you're having trouble there looking for that, and often you do, remember that the fovea centralis looks slightly darker and it lies in the center of the macular region. And if you just can't find it, then have the patient look directly into the light. 
So as you see with these pictures, you have a creamy to orange, nice, normal retina on the left, and you have diabetic retinopathy on the right. And any time that you might hear that your patient or see that your patient has hemorrhages, hard exudates, cotton wool spots, these are all tell-all signs for diabetic retinopathy. And let's look more closely under the heading of, of common problems. First, diabetic retinopathy again. These microaneurysms are the earliest detectable sign. Ruptured microaneurysms result in retinal hemorrhages, either superficially like flame-shaped hemorrhages or deeper layers of the retina like blot and dot hemorrhages and cotton wool spots. All of these should ring a bell to that it's most likely you're talking about diabetic retinopathy. AV nicking. What does this look like when an artery and a vein intersect? Then there's this little kind of bridge looking thing where there's the intersection, it's supposed to be smooth. Remember again that AV nicking is a sign of chronic hypertension. Uh, diabetes is the wrong answer. And Arcosinillus, a nice picture here on the slide, but we can talk about its description as well. These two geriatric patients have a color change happening, appearing around their eye. Um, there's a cloudy appearance of the cornea usually with either a gray or a white arc or circle around the limbus. And so um, I've seen this as gray, white, pink, even blue. But this is called Arcosinillus. And what is their underlying issue? You remember it's hyperlipidemia. So it's due to deposition of lipid material. Um, the Arcus has no effect on the vision. And even though you treat the lipid panel aggressively, this is a permanent color change of the eye. Arcosinil is very common in the geriatric population. Conjunctivitis is the most common eye disorder. Inflammation and infection of the conjunctiva known as pink eye on the street, resulting from allergies, bacteria, viruses, or even STD, STIs. And what you note other than the red eye Itching, burning, redness, again, increased amounts of tearing. Blurred vision is possible. Sensation of a foreign body. Swelling of the eyelid, and even the eyelids may show a crust of sticky mucopurulent discharge. That red eye, when somebody has conjunctivitis, in general, there is no pain. And that is a highlight to remember, there's no pain. Redness, as I suggested, maybe any of these other signs and symptoms, but it doesn't hurt inside the eye. And you don't want an eye to hurt inside the eye. For example, even if you're hit by a baseball, you're like, you'll, take, you'll teach the patient, okay, the bones around your eye are gonna be sore for this week, but it should not hurt inside your eye. And if it does, I want you to come back and see me uh, because there's often bleeding there. And so we have a red eye, and now we have to determine the cause of the conjunctivitis. If you have purulent drainage with a red eye, obviously that's bacterial. And it can be self-limiting, so you don't have to do anything. It should be fine in 48 to 72 hours. Or you could select a common antibiotic drop to order levofloxacin, ofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, tobramycin, or gentamicin ophthalmic solution. If you have a red eye and it's also very watery, the discharge is watery, that is a viral diagnosis and really there is no treatment, it is just symptomatic care. If you have a red eye and the discharge is stringy, S-T-R-I-N-G-Y, it is stringy and there's increased tearing, that's usually allergic and an oral antihistamine would be appropriate there. And then lastly, uh, if you have a patient with a red eye 
And not only is there purulent discharge, but it is copious purulent discharge. It just continues and continues to build and flow out. That is most likely gonococcal or chlamydial conjunctivitis. And indeed, the genitalia have been in the eye. Right? They may not remember, but it happened. And so, it doesn't matter if you have it up high or down low, the treatment is the same. A shot of ceftriaxone and a pill of azithromycin. Corneal abrasion, does this hurt? Yes. And there's usually trauma to the eye resulting in interruption again of the epithelial surface, usually by dumb things we do, like pulling the sheet up as you turn over at night and you whop the sheet up into your eye, or your own fingernail in your eye, scratching your eye. There is intense pain in the affected eye that worsens with time. Tearing and redness are very common as well. Um, and then with regard to lab and diagnostic, there again is a recent history of trauma to the eye that you want to ascertain. And a sodium fluorescein stain is used to detect um, the abrasion. For management, we anesthetize the eye for a thorough exam to ensure also there's no foreign body. Topical antibiotic ointment may be prescribed, especially in patients who wear contacts. It is encouraged. Steroid and anesthetic drops are essentially contraindicated. Anesthetic drops are contraindicated after the initial exam because why? If it hurts inside the eye, we want them to come back and see us. And so it should be healed in about 24 hours, and if not, they need referral. Glaucoma versus cataract. Mm -hmm. Very common, very common problems in the geriatric population. And which one is which? Well, I have them here in a chart formation, but I'm going to go down each one first. First of all, glaucoma. So with glaucoma, the pathology, essentially it is increased intraocular pressure within the eye, of course. And there's open angle and closed angle. There's chronic and acute. And I used to get these messed up until I started kind of trying to see the difference. In open angle, this is chronic glaucoma. So as long as the angle remains open, then you, the flow can occur in and out. It's chronic. But when it closes, there's closed angle, that's an acute emergency. And so again, open is chronic, closed is acute. The cause of glaucoma is really unknown. But what we know about signs and symptoms is that patients go asymptomatic for a very long time. There's elevated intraocular pressure, and you need to remember what normal intraocular pressure is and it is 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury, 10 to 20. Um, and so, you know, you gotta be able to read, is this too high or about right? So elevated IOP occurs eventually and builds and builds and builds. On the physical exam, you see this here in the slide on the left-hand side, it looks like an ice cream scooper has scooped out the back of the eye, and that is known as cupping of the disc. That's the earliest sign that you would see on the physical exam. And complaints of the family with chronic open angle, they usually talk about the fact that daddy is telescoping. He's looking around the room, left to right, left to right, like he's looking through a telescope. Well, it makes sense because his problem is there's constriction of visual fields. You see this here in the upper left picture um, on the slide. So this African-American lady, you can see in the middle very clearly, you see her ethnicity. But there's a man on the left and a woman on the right, and he might be Asian and she may be Caucasian, I don't know because the periphery is blurred, and that is there's constriction of the visual fields. Once there is closed angle glaucoma, again, this is an acute situation characterized by extreme pain, blurred vision, and halos around lights with a dilated pupil or even fixed. 
Now careful, halos around lights is also a feature of cataracts. But notice here with glaucoma, there is pain with halos around lights. And again, labs, diagnostics include tonometry screening. And of course, when is this recommended? It is recommended nationally in men and women by the age of 40. And the management of glaucoma depends on which type. For open angle or chronic glaucoma, meds like alpha-2 adrenergic agonists or beta adrenergic blockers, timolol eye drops, meiotic agents like pilocarpine. And for closed angle glaucoma, again, this is an emergency into the ER, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like acetazolamide may be used or osmotic diuretics like mannitol and then they have to go to surgery. So while you're kind of waiting for that surgery, if you need that, how would you know that your patient is improving who has an acute closed angle glaucoma after giving them, say, an osmotic diuretic? You would expect that the pain should be less than it was before you gave it, right? And then for cataracts, clouding and opacification of the normal clear lens of the eye. And um, the highest cause of treatable blindness and the most common surgical procedure in the geriatric population. It's a senile cataract. It's not a cabbage, but it is a cataract. And I list for you, uh, a rather a laundry list of causes or conditions where there's been an increased incidence, aging, heredity, trauma, toxins, drugs, smoking, alcohol theories, congenital theories, diabetes may contribute to some patients, UV sunlight exposure, being in tanning beds or on the beach or out laying out in the sun too much. But the leading risk factor, interesting, for the development of a cataract, if you don't know, is simply aging. And that's why probably it is the most common surgical procedure in the geriatric patient. Signs and symptoms, painless, clouded, blurred, or dim vision. They begin to say, oh, it's difficult to uh, see at night, difficult to vision at night. Like, oh, those oncoming car lights just really blind me. I'm not going to be able to drive much longer. Well, it didn't bother her when she was 30, but it's bothering her when she's 70. I bet she's got a cataract. Sensitivity to light and glare, sometimes fading or yellowing of colors, and diplopia, double vision in a single eye with halos around lights and yet it is painless. Those three really help sharpen that you've got your differential correct. Again, diplopia, double vision in a single eye, halos around lights, and it's painless. The need for brighter light for reading or other activities leading on to no red reflex and opacity of the lens. Sometimes you can see it without even a pen light. And what do we do for cataract patients is we refer them to an ophthalmologist for surgery. And most patients do really well. Some struggle a little bit who, uh, it tends to go really well or not, if you notice that. Um, but most people do quite well. So with regard to the physiologic changes that happen in the musculoskeletal system as we age, sarcopenia is a highlight. In which age group would you expect to see the most marked signs of sarcopenia? And the answer is the oldest old. What is this? As we age, there's decreased muscle mass and strength, loss of lean body mass, and that lean body mass is replaced by fat. No matter how much you work out or how fit you think you are, this will happen to everybody as a normal physiologic uh, change with aging. And um, not only will that occur, but fat moves around the body. D, redistribution of fat occurs, and we don't get to pick where it goes. How about that? 
As you age, you say, okay, I weigh this amount. And 10 years from now, you'll get on the scale and maybe you may weigh that amount. But guess what? It's not in the same place it used to be when you were a young person. So we know there's redistribution of fat that occurs. Low bone mass develops, intervertebral disc generation occurs, changes in stature with kyphosis and height reduction. Everybody gets shorter as they age because of disc degeneration as well as some kyphosis. So possible findings or results. There's decreased total body water, increased percentage of adipose tissue, and particularly until about the age of 60, and then it begins to decrease some. Degeneration of cartilage occurs for fibrosis. There's decreased joint elasticity, and then the implications there. For sarcopenia, there's an increased risk of disability, falls, and unstable gait. Increased percentage of body fat, height reduction from intervertebral disc degeneration, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, limited range of motion, and eventually joint instability as well. So not great news, but normal physiologic changes that occur in the musculoskeletal system. And finally, a look at changes in the uh, immune system. Why is it that elder people, elderly people, just again, don't do so well when they get older? It's like their immune systems just fall apart. Well, we know it happens, but you need to know the physiologic base for why that happens. And again, the theory is immunosenescence. The immune system's diminished function with age leads to a decline in the response to infection. And so um, our innate immunity functions decline. That is macrophages, natural killer cells, neutrophils decline. Our adaptive immune responses diminish. There's decreased thymic hormone production resulting in a decreased number of functioning T cells. There's decreased antibody production and response and overall a diminished response to antigens. So the elderly then with the possible findings and results, overall there's an increased susceptibility to infection. There's poor wound healing, exacerbation of chronic diseases, and waning vaccine-induced antibody response as well because of the expected physiologic changes in the immune system in the geriatric patient. And that concludes Common Problems Part 2.